I'm curious how you all find comic books and what your experience has been. At Comic Con? Yes. Yeah. Ben? A lot. I mean, it's a lot. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, this is my 11th time coming, so obviously I enjoy it quite a bit. <laughs> And I'm the only one on the panel in costume tonight. I feel like a dork. No. Oh, no, not no. Here. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I definitely I will be in costume. But it's okay. I will be in costume. Oh, sweet. Okay. All right. You, I, yeah, I just put on my yeah. costume because I ran with Shoshana from another area. And so we got here. I will be putting on my costume. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. I am cosplaying tonight as Dateline victim number two. No. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Oh. Well done. <laughs> funny. That's funny. That's original. I like it. So you, you had your thumbs down for Comic Con. Why? Um, was I'm, I've had some positive experiences and some negative experiences. We were just discussing, you know, comparing this with other conventions that we've been to. And one thing that I said that I will say again is that this is the 50th year of Comic Con. And it's very, very large. But we still, they've had 50 years to figure out how to fix uh, <laughs> the common problems that have arisen. And it's I mean, so true, I mean, think about it. Um, so, I mean, we here, you know, we've arrived at Comic Con at the convention, and their website says, "Oh, the policies. These are what we have to follow. This is what you have to do." I got here, and you know, it really didn't happen with what they had said. So some things happened 11 years ago, and then some things are happening now. If the convention was in a small, maybe like 3,000 people, let's just say, and maybe two people with a disability or five people with a disability would work out, it's fine. But this has no excuse. This is a much larger scale. It's nice for me to be able to look around and see different people, you know, and being able to exude their love and passion, but it's still not fully accessible for disabled people. We were commenting um, that there is a discrepancy when you will ask one uh, person one question and then you'll ask another volunteer or staff the same question and you will get two completely different answers. And that can be very confusing in terms of accessibility. So if you need to get accommodations for something, if you're told by one person and you get to another location, like the 10 mile walk between the convention halls, it's very frustrating to be told either incorrect information or just there's no, they just don't know. And that can be very, very frustrating. Uh, and like I said earlier, I don't have a solution for it, but it's not great. So maybe that, that could be fixed. <laughs> I want to say, I want to say one thing because as the person here who's, who's sort of come here the longest, I think, out of everybody. I don't know about you folks, but I know, <laughs> I think you're I've been coming here. Okay. Is that how many years? Is it 11? This is my 11th. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm up there. I'm about so, nine years. Okay, so, yeah. so I'm not yeah. close. Oh, okay, perfect. So, um, one thing that I, that, there's so many things wrong, but one thing that they have improved, um, I used to have a guide dog. And I would come here with my guide dog, and they would try to put me and my guide dog in one in Hall H in particular, in one of the spaces assigned for wheelchairs. Hmm. Uh, I had a black lab. If you've been right here, right here. If you've been in the rooms already, you know when they turn those lights down, it's dark. It's really dark. Yeah. And I'm looking at them, going, guys, you know, first of all. These dogs are not cheap. Yeah. These dogs are upwards of fifty thousand dollars coming with all the training and everything. Are you gonna guarantee me that my dog's not gonna get injured? No. Then how about we think of a better way to do this? Because I'm not sitting there with my dog. And I know in Hall H now they have a certain area that they try to put as many people with service and guide dogs as they can, which is an improvement. Got a long way to go, but uh, and with my dog, 
often they'll put me in the very front of the speakers. <laughs> Her hearing is very important to me. So, if you're going to place me in front of the speakers, I'm like, uh, really? <laughs> Plus, the interpreters are often sitting at the very front, uh, I'm sorry, behind the speakers, so all the sound is going the opposite way. If the interpreter's back here, then they're going, uh, hello, I can't hear what, the speak what you know, is being said. So there's problems with uh, you know, seating. Then also there's a lot of discrepancies, you know, with mm, fitting my needs, your needs, her needs, you know. You know, I don't know what the, there has to be a better solution somewhere. Um, and I can't say for sure if this is true or not, but I wish that they had more people in the executive, you know, committee that were actually disabled, that actually know what was going on. So they know real life situations and what they look like. So, I mean, one thing that I wish, I really, really wish this convention had was a quiet room. Because, you know, you, me, this dog, is, are being stimulated by this busy atmosphere. It is a mental breakdown. We need, to, we need a place to stop and just let loose. You know, people, you know, people say, oh, keep moving, keep moving. But I just need to stop to give her water, to give her food, whatever. There's no place to actually stop and take a minute. So I really wish that we had one because, oh my gosh, it's crazy. And I know... <laughs> I mean, I'm lucky that I have my dog, but chill, chill. <laughs> and, you know, and she wasn't here, this would be a horrible experience. And, and she's that, sleeping right now. <laughs> to, that, to that point, it can be very overwhelming for people who have a mental illness, who are being overstimulated. And I think the one thing that I've noticed today is I've been screamed at more for standing against the wall, and no one has explained to me why. <laughs> yep. And it's very jarring, and it's, un it's unnerving. And... I did not like that. <laughs> and I went into one panel with my dog. We went in, we were in the front row for, you know, the deaf, the deaf seating area. It said reserved for deaf, right? So I came in and my dog sat and I just had to sit down really quick to get her situated. And a woman came up to me and said, you can't sit on the floor. And I was like, oh, I was bombarded. I said, okay, I just got here. I'm just putting my dog, you know, she said, are you deaf? And I said, yes. <laughs> well, you can't sit on the floor. I'm like, okay, I just got here. Please. So she left. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, now I'm sitting in a chair. Um, later she said, oh, it's just fire code that you can't sit on the ground. I said, I get it. But I have legal needs, which is my dog. I need to take care of her before myself. But, yeah, I mean, I just really wish that we had a place that we can just go relax or do something and figure something out because people keep saying, move, you can't stop here, you can't stand here, whatever the case may be. And it's not really disabled friendly. Um, even though, you know, you can walk or you, you can or can't see, it doesn't matter. With a dog, without a dog, I mean, there's just so many needs that, that we need a safe place just to relax. And I know that we have a lot of people, and there's not always areas available, but I wish that was one thing that we did have. Have you um, ever been to a convention or an event where um, you've had a really fantastic experience? You feel like, oh wow, they really did this well. Yes. Yeah, I've been to a few. I don't yeah, mean to like few. crap talk Comic Con. I mean, but it was, <laughs> but that was a smaller convention. Yeah. So I think that there's a little bit more room to, you know, grow. Mm -hmm. One reason I think it's because their execs or the higher ups, you know, it's a very small. I mean, there's not many people that you have to go through. Here you have so many people and the higher ups that they don't really communicate with, you know, the other groups of people, so. Mm. Yeah, and uh, I last year went, for the first time, I went to um, a Supernatural convention, <laughs> which was amazing. <laughs> Thought about you the whole time. Um, it, it, was, it was incredible, and I was, um, 
I was struck, having been here so many times, I was struck at how um, accommodating they really were. How they, you know, come over here, we've got for the Saturday night concert, they, they said, we've got seating for you over here, um, come in here, we're going to put, I mean, so much so that I made a point of saying something to staff and saying, you have no idea, this is absolutely amazing. Accommodations, what I do for a living, I'm a counselor at a university, a disability counselor, so I, I, I know the law, I know what it's supposed to do, I know what Comic-Con often fails to do, not to, you know, be biting the hand that feeds us, but <laughs> yeah, well, I got, I'm a truth seeker, I'm a truth speaker. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the entire experience, that whole four days was absolutely amazing as far as, well, the whole thing was, but accommodations and, and making sure that I and my fellow attendees with disabilities were, were well looked after, if you want to call it that, without being you know, caregiving, not that type of thing. So. I want to play. Yeah, I had the same experience. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I've had the exact opposite experience. I've been treated better here. I've been treated in complete crap. Great. Um, I got screamed at. I wasn't allowed to be in the photo room. I couldn't use my scooter. Um, I shouldn't have been there because I'm too embarrassing to be around. Um, it, my friends were very unhappy hearing me be screamed at by um, the executive there. So I've I've had a better time here, even with the shortcomings. I feel that they try here, and it depends on who's currently staffing like some of the smaller conventions. Um, so they've had better experiences, but they're both ambulatory completely, and I'm not, and that changes things a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the thing that, I mean, just for anybody, what I have seen is that it's, too, it's a twofold problem. Pop culture has exploded. So maybe they, I don't think anybody could have predicted this. But uh, the problem is also that I believe that the convention has actually outgrown this area. I mean, San Diego is not big enough to handle the crowd, so just me at times crossing the street would take me almost a half hour. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they need more elevators here. And they do. And the, yes. that and the train? Oh my god. This yeah. is an old building. It's not, it's built in the 70s or 60s, and, and you could tell. And I, I uh, a friend of my, one of my dearest friends used to be the associate director for disabled services here. Um, she's she's left the city, um, and and I've had conversations with her about about this very thing. Um, and the fact is that not just the convention has grown to that but the number of people attending who have disabilities who do need some kind of accommodation for those disabilities has has blown up. Yeah, you sure. Know, the numbers have just, and, and they're just simply not equipped. No. Um, the other thing is, I think Kaya's right. I think that there's probably no one with a disability background um, in the executive level making these kinds of decisions. Um, I volunteer, but no, I mean, they need people. I mean, but they, but they need somebody with with the background to be able to say, you know what, this is not going to work. We need to do it maybe like this, and get the input. And, and I don't know how we change that. I know that on Sunday afternoon there is a con talk back. Uh, panel where you can go and I think the president of Comic-Con goes there and so you can go there and talk to him and say look dude this is not working unfortunately just because of you know things I haven't made it to that in 11 years I have to really do that one of these times um, to bring that up because I know I'm not the only person who feels this way We've got to change it, and it's got to be our voices that are heard, because we're the ones with the disabilities. Um, I think that with some of this, there has been slow um, progress with media, 
I mean, you see more disabled people showing up to conventions because we see ourselves and we always like enjoy these shows. We want to meet people who are in the shows, meaning without that, you know, something can change. But with how the convention is run, not just here, but other conventions too, you have to figure out how you can accommodate us. Because if you don't, if we don't show up, then you're not really representing that uh, fandom or that story or that show or whatever. And everything just kind of goes off the radar. So that means that there won't be change. Um, so people say, oh, there's a convention you know, for the show, I, but I think there's a correlation between those two. If you don't have the, the fans here and the audience, then the show won't continue, right? So you have to, there has to be a connection somewhere. You have to figure out something between the two for us to be able to come and to be included. Because if we're not included, then what's the point of being here? Obviously, we have some celebrities that are here um, with, with disabilities. Um, what are you guys enjoying that is representation of popular culture right now? <laughs> And a blank. <laughs> and that's case well, in point, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> With other groups, we were talking, the other group, we were talking about the pros and cons of representation. Um, some of it was good representation and some of it was not so good. Um, I think that the problem mostly has to do with the studios. Mm. Um, I mean, we do have more representation happening. But there still is a lot of commonalities or stereotypes. Um, like uh, you were saying, you know, a blind person is always, you know, in the character that's blind. I mean, they're not the main character. Or you have a deaf person who's always the same, same deaf person. <laughs> so, I mean, it's good to have more disabled characters in a TV show and in movies. However, it doesn't matter how that character is represented and shown. You know, we were talking about the movie with Emily Blunt. She's representing as a blind person, and she's put in that role. And it should be a fully blind person. I mean, then there's Scarlett Johansson, who recently came out saying, Oh, I can be any male, female, animal, tree, or whatever. I can play any role. I'm like... You know, so you have the casting problem as well as, you know, we were talking about disabled actors being presented, you know, with the script and they, can, they say, okay, maybe it doesn't fit with my own life experiences. So they have two choices. They can either accept the role and go ahead with the script and follow it, get paid for the role, but doesn't really sh be shown well and doesn't fit their real life experiences or they can protest it and not accept the role but they're not going to get paid so who you know puts that an able person or they'll put an able person in there it doesn't matter so you watch it on the big screen or on tv and it doesn't really match who i am and you have that in the back of your head you know whose fault is that is it the actors or is that the studios because you know that the actors can't really, they don't really have the power to speak up against this because if they do, then they won't get hired. So, yeah, I mean, there's pros and cons to this. What about a film like A Quiet Place? Where, where there, that, that, was a, that was a really interesting portrayal for the young girl. And actually she ends up being the, the reason they all lived at the end. Oh, spoilers, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Well, I mean, at the same, that movie was interesting for several reasons. The first one is that um, it was one of, at the very beginning scenes, one of the very beginning scenes, she, they show that she has a cochlear implant. In the movie, it was, um, it was like feedback, like noise. I mean, I have a cochlear implant, and that does not happen. <laughs> the hearing yes, but the cochlear implants don't. I mean, I know I have one. So I was watching that, I'm like, okay, I just started five minutes into it, really? Okay. But, um, I mean, it's true. And the story itself, I mean, okay. But anyways, um, 
but the purpose and the intent of casting that deaf person for that role is, was good. And it was work, you know, became popular, you know, now there's going to be a quiet place too. But, you know, I think it's good. But, go back to that first five minutes, five minutes that I was telling you about, you know, there's obviously still room for improvement. So, I mean, my question for everyone here at the table is, you know, has it been a slow progression? Or do you think that the progression has been fast enough for you? Or is it just slowly, should it go progress more? We need more progression. We're not showing every disability yet. What we show isn't always fair. Um, there might not be enough representation of, of deaf culture, but there's more and more now. But there's not a lot with chronic illness, or if there is, it's things like Me Before You, where basically we're... Oh, that was such a role. Um, represented as our lives aren't worth it, mm -hmm. our partners are worth everything, and we're throwaway people, and my family and friends and people watched it, and they're like, are you going to watch it? But then they watch it, and then they go, you're never, ever going to fall in love. No one can ever love you, because they see this character who's got a chronic illness, and it's very, very sick, and it's just too much work. And so then they're, you're, you're not worth it, because you need extra accommodations. And so we were talking about you know, stereotypes, how and what, you know, that you see on TV or the big screen, you know, and I'm meeting you in real life, I'm like, wait, you're not, you know, what you see on them, what is real, but you're actually faking it, you know what I mean, like people saying that, that's why we need to stress more, like people doing that on the screen, not just for us, but for everyone else too, because what they see, what the audience has in the back of their minds watching it, Whenever you watch, whenever you meet another person that's ambulatory or another deaf person or that has a mental illness or something, you have to be able to keep that in mind whenever you're watching that on the big screen and be able to match that. So I mean, I mean, I'm not going to go into psychology, but you have, we're believing what we see on the big screen more than what you actually meet in real life and see in real life. So people say, oh, why do you need to see yourself on the screen? It's not just for us, but it's for everyone else too, because. I mean, it's just a stupid, really, cycle, because the execs or the higher-ups who run TV shows, they're thinking of what's going on the big screen, but they're not thinking about the real-life people, so it's just a never-ending, stupid cycle. To, the, to that point, um, no, I'd love to be compared to Angelina Jolie, I would, but Girl Interrupted, when you talk about mental illness, you see it on screen. I didn't bring my tinfoil hat tonight, and I don't talk to aliens right now, but... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I could be from I, another planet. I could be. Um, the Earth is flat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank but, you, good night. <laughs> but I feel like there's a certain expectation when people meet me or... Uh, anybody with a mental illness or an invisible illness that for some reason we're going to turn into a dinosaur um, and that's not the case uh, I, you know I, I like to binge watch Grey's Anatomy and eat right out of the ice cream tub just like every other person um, and I think that in media and film it's it has gotten better but I mean, we just had a Netflix movie I think it was um, Into the Bone or oh, to the Bone. To the Bone. Yes. yes. Which was a film about anorexia, which is a very serious mental illness. <laughs> and it glamorizes, and I think a lot of media and TV glamorizes mental illness as well. And I don't think that that's helpful because it's giving outside people an expectation of what it's like to have a mental illness or to be deaf or to be blind. And I think that to make things better, it would be 
it would be great if people with disability could be creating these, this, the media themselves. Let pe let um, like Shoshana and this book. You know, that's great. More of that, please. I would like that a lot. And the it's, film challenge that Nick and Yes, and the film challenge. You know, let people with disabilities create and use their. Let, let them speak instead of Hollywood executives deciding that Scarlett Johansson has to be in a wheelchair and she also has to be Asian and also she has to have schizophrenia. It's not necessary. It's really and to add that, add that, you know, the creators, yes, but also to have the crew behind the scenes. We need disabled people because... Like I was talking about, you know, with the guide dog situation with the movies, um, if the crew behind the, screen, the scenes has experienced that and knows how it works, then they know how to fix it if something were to go awry. You know, then they can say, no, that's not working, let's go back and fix it. You know, you need more of that full inclusion. That's what we do need. And we also, it would, and we, it would be creating jobs for people. It's very frustrating when you're watching a film about um, somebody in a wheelchair and there's not a single person on crew and there's no reason why a writer could not be in a wheelchair or, or a when PA. They get, they're in an inaccessible place and you see that the only entrance has stairs and no, there are way too many places <laughs> like that. But, but how did they get in there? I was just watching. <laughs> Uh, what, what's that new show on stars that I was just watching and has that character that in the book wasn't in a wheelchair but the character is and my friend told me to watch and I watched the first episode and haven't watched beyond and I watched how they got into the spy building and the scanners that they had to go through and there was no way that the wheelchair could get through there so how was she in the building? <laughs> is that going to be a loophole later because I want to see them break into the building through the accessible entrance if the rider was actually disabled, they would have caught that. The crew, someone would have caught that. But we're here in the audience, we're looking at it going, what, really? It is nice that a character that was not disabled in the book was made disabled for the show. Added representation, that's nice. It's just... Do it right. They're, do it right. Like, that was glaring to me, and my able friend who told me to watch it didn't even notice <laughs> that, gee, there's something strange. And it's like that all the time. You know that the actor has to be, you know, ambulatory, even if they might be disabled, because they might not have, or they, they at least aren't in a wheelchair very often. Um, if the set isn't accessible and they just have the wheelchair in the scene but the set isn't made accessible so therefore they just carry it up steps or onto the screen or something they <laughs> operated um totally al alice uh stoker yeah. her uh oh, so okay. she um they had to be behind the stage because they actually didn't have a ramp right so oh, i mean she won an award yeah. but they couldn't they didn't have a ramp to get up to, for her to earn her award. I mean, really, how much money would they have to pay to put this on, but you couldn't it even afford a, to put a ramp up there? It was a Broadway and show. And they I heard that the, the right. theater has a ramp normally, or sometimes has a ramp for other shows, but they took it away for the Aesthetics. award show. Aesthetics. For Aesthetics. Yeah. And so then she's treated like a second class citizen. Oh, can I, can I just add one thing about yeah. the whole ramp and the, and the Tonys? <laughs> If you look at the the award shows and the number of mostly women who have tripped going up the stairs, yes. oh right, yes. Yes. yes, there's this little concept called universal design, <laughs> <laughs> and if they put the ramps in, the go program. with me here. If they put the ramps in, okay, you know if it's me in a dress like that, I'm still gonna trip, but maybe we will have less of that happening. Put the ramp in. I mean, the well, and then there's always the the benefits all of us. Yeah. Yes, yes it universal and design. The and fact then that they literally built New York City and Newsies and they couldn't build a ramp 
I, I find ludicrous. Well, then they always have like, oh, isn't that nice that Chris Evans helped her up? And I'm like, okay, but we're ignoring that the problem was there to begin with. Like, we're focusing on the wrong thing. <laughs> it's always, like, yeah. especially in inspiration porn, it's always yeah. the helper. Or like, there's the, the person in the wheelchair who gets stuck somewhere and there's a hurricane coming and this nice boy scout comes and pushes them to their home. And the article is all about the boy scout who pushed the wheelchair mm-hmm. person to safety and not... Why wasn't there a sidewalk? <laughs> <laughs> if you want the opposite story of that, um, look up Roselle, R-O-Z-E-L-L-E, the guide dog and World Trade Center on 9-11. Oh, so Roselle and her handler guided quite a few people down from one of the towers and saved their lives because it was pitch black right. and the only one yeah. who really knew what they were doing was the, the handler dog. and the dog. I didn't know and so they that. saved That's quite amazing. a few people. So that should be a movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That should totally be a yeah. movie. Yeah. Who wouldn't want to watch a heroic dog and then also <laughs> talk about disabilities and universal design and Plus, it's a true story. Yeah. All right, Netflix, we're gonna. All right, guys. But we're gonna cast a boy dog. Yeah. Yeah.